What does it take for a man to push his physical and mental powers to the limit? Crossing icy chasms and scaling cliff tops is only part of it. Is getting frostbite on Everest and the threat of losing limbs enough of a test? Being told that I might actually lose my toe is... I just don't know. I just don't know what to say. Or does falling into a bottomless crevasse cross the boundary? This could have been catastrophic. This is the story of Richard Parks and his 737 challenge to conquer the peaks and poles of the world faster than any other human being. The challenge ahead was to stand on the highest mountain on all seven continents and the three poles, the geographic north, the south pole and Everest, the highest pole on earth. And all of this within a seven month period. No one had ever accomplished this extraordinary feat. I've spent almost 18 months training for this. Uh, I've spent, of those 18 months, almost eight months in a tent on expedition. You know, I'm... I, the, success, the success of this is important to me and, you know, we want to raise funds for Marie Curie Cancer Care and that, realistically, that only happens if you know, if I succeed. Without the unwavering support of his parents, being forced to retire through injury from his career as an international rugby player would have been difficult to accept. Even contemplating a challenge of this magnitude, a complete reassessment of his path in life, would have been unthinkable if it hadn't been for his strong network of family and friends. I think he was trying to evaluate his whole future, where he was going to go from where he was at that moment in time. and he then allowed the 737 challenge to take over his life. Oi, heel, heel. The first time he mentioned it was that um, he wanted to have a chat with Lee and myself. So he basically at that time ran through the challenge with us, told us all his perceptions of the danger and the risks that he was going to undertake. And, uh, he then allowed us to question him in depth about the extent of the dangers and the possibility of him not coming back. And he was very clear about that. There is a possibility that he, he wouldn't come back. I think I was shocked and I realised the enormity of it and I just thought, well, if he really sets his mind to it, he will do it. Is it achievable, considering he's never climbed a mountain before, to my knowledge? I mean, he's been on schoolboy trips, but I don't think he's even attempted any mountains. So. Uh, yeah, if anyone can, he will. I mean, God willing, I mean, it's won't be for the lack of the ability to do it, the wanting to do it. I think he will do it. Ben, Ben. Dig in. Dig it in, mate, come on. It would take 18 months of physical and mental preparation before the challenge could begin. Good work. 20 years of rugby training was a base for what lay ahead. But crossing pain barriers of this nature in late 2009 was a whole new experience. That was a good test. Trekking up and down the Brecon Beacons on a 24-hour endurance test helped build an ability to deal with sleep deprivation. Three, two, one, go. Being immersed in near freezing water in June 2010 tested his body's capability to function should he slip into the icy waters of the Arctic. Trial climbs in Scotland, the Alps, Peru, Tibet and Alaska throughout the year were all necessary and useful tests of his resolve. His team of mountaineering experts, Jagged Globe, were involved in all of the logistics. Raising a million pounds for cancer care was Richard's driving force behind the challenge. Derek's brother was lost to cancer um, and Derek's had cancer and um, we were very, very fortunate because Derek obviously has still not had any treatment because it was discovered very early. Um, he had the surgery and um, 
we haven't looked back. It's nice to be able to help. I don't think it's nice, it's a duty to be able to help those less fortunate. And I think this is Richard's attitude. His visits to the hospice in Penarth strengthened his will to succeed. You know, cancer's affecting my family deeply and, uh, and coming here and visiting some of the staff and, uh, you know, and the amazing nurses and, and hopefully, you know, if appropriate today, maybe having a chat with a few of the patients, you know, really puts it in perspective for me. And, and uh, you know, I'm sure when it gets tough out there, you know, I'll, I'll be able to draw on, uh, on some of the inspiration. By early December 2010, the preparations had come to an end. Antarctica would be the first destination. The departure point, an historical spot at Cardiff Bay, from where Captain Scott had set sail on his ill-fated expedition. It just so happens that, uh, that my challenge falls 100 years after Scott's Terranova expedition left Cardiff. And uh, the SS Terranova set sail from Cardiff Bay here and um, it's a very special place within Cardiff and, uh, and it's special to have my friends and family and to leave from here. It's game time now, isn't it? And you know, it's time to stand up and deliver. I am pretty nervous, though. Derek and Lee would accompany him to the airport and his long journey would finally take off. The actual journey to the South Pole would take two weeks. Flights from the UK to Punta Arenas in southern Chile and on to Union Glacier base camp on Antarctica. Air temperatures around base camp vary between minus five and minus 15 Celsius, dropping to minus 26 around the pole. An early casualty in Richard's group of five meant that one explorer suffered frostbite and left immediately. We got dropped off in a, in, a, in, a, in a twin otter plane, which is, you know, a sort of five-seater plane, and uh, we had to refuel on the way there because it doesn't carry enough fuel to even uh, to even make the journey from Union Glacier Base Camp to 89 degrees, which is 111 kilometres from the pole. It was around minus 30 degrees we got dropped off in, and, and that was another real shock to the system. We really are on our own now. I've just watched uh, the Twin Otter leave, which is our last connection with civilization, I guess, for the next week or so, weather dependent. It really is awesome. Um, we really are in the middle of absolute nowhere. Crossing the last degree to the pole itself entails skiing for 111 kilometers. And that means pulling heavy loads against a headwind and a wind chill of minus 40 degrees. The group would basically be expending the equivalent in energy of a marathon each and every day. Nothing can prepare you for that. I climbed Penta Van for 24 hours and that was a walk in the park compared to that. That's just brutal with, you know, nothing to judge your progress or, you know, no stimuli visual. That was brutal. I can't wait to get in the tent now and get a fire on. Despite the occasional whiteout, the weather proved to be relatively kind and Christmas Day was spent within 15 miles of the pole. By Boxing Day, only five miles to go, but members of the group were exhausted. Another night in their tents. After skiing for, I don't even know, six or seven days, it's been a really tough day today. It's been a long push, I think we're on the 16th hour maybe. But the other guys were shattered and decided to Head straight for camp and set tent up. T tent up, sorry. I think that's bullshit. I need a journey finishes at the South Pole with my gear.
December 27th, and Richard reached the South Pole. That's it. The first leg completed. Wow, well, I've lost the words really. It's been a, uh, it's been a tough seven days. It's been incredibly rewarding. What an awesome feeling. You can't help but be sucked into, you know, the history and the mystique, you know, of the South Pole and of Antarctica and the Hamilton Scott building behind you. He could now rest until the last day of 2010. First of January 2011, and I'm stood at the geographical South Pole. The race would now begin. To stand on the highest peak on each of the seven continents and the three poles in the next seven months. Next step, Mount Vinson, the highest peak on Antarctica, about 600 miles away from the pole. There had been a lot of waiting around, and I was very conscious that once the 1st of January came, at that point, really, it became a race. Vincent, it can be, you know, pretty hostile. So again, I, you know, I was apprehensive, but, you know, confident and actually looking forward to getting on, on a mountain. The weather could have been a huge hurdle to the success of this leg, but the conditions for the next three days were good. Well, a mixture of luck and really good planning means we've missed the worst of the fog and the low vis, and it's actually spectacular. Just approaching the summit ridge now. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't absolutely shattered. Climbing in 24 hours sunlight is not only disorientating, it's also exhausting, as the concept of resting in darkness is lost and the body is teased into a false pattern. Richard's physical fitness, though, was already paying dividends. Normal summit attempts had taken up to nine hours to complete. Richard's push would be less than five. <laughs> summit, Mount Vincent. High five. January 2011, what an awesome feeling. Only 700 people have ever summited Mount Vinson, and Richard Parks on January 8th became one of them. The triumph, though, would soon turn to frustration. A fuel strike and blockades in Chile prevented any flights from Antarctica to Punta Arenas. Then the plane had technical problems. Then the weather closed in. I'm sort of running out of things to do to keep me occupied. I've packed, repacked, unpacked. But the weather on Aconcagua is pretty crap at the moment. You know, maybe it's good I'm here and, and not up there anyway. I mean, it, there's always a positive. Well, I try and find one anyway. When the plane did arrive, there had been 12 days of delays and the all-important clock had been ticking. Less than two weeks into the challenge and he was behind schedule. January 22nd, and the journey from Chile to the Andes of Argentina and Aconcagua. It's the highest mountain outside the Himalayas. It's the second highest mountain of the Seven Summits. It's got a really poor summit success rate. I was a little bit nervous again, but, you know, confident. I just, but apprehensive, yeah. Confluencia, at just under 4,000 metres, is first camp. The aptly named Plaza de Mulas, 300 metres higher, is base camp. The summit strategy would need careful consideration. Conditions higher up were bad, and avalanches had come close to their camp overnight. Hey. Casa, Casa Park, San Diego, home sweet home. Oh. 
The condor's nest, Nido de Condores, is at five and a half thousand metres, and the altitude is now a serious issue to contend with. The prognosis was for high winds, and the likelihood of storms was increasing. The decision now was whether to push for the summit and bypass Camp 3, or stick to the original plan. The downside of pushing on meant less acclimatisation to deal with the altitude, compounded by an exhausting 18-hour climbing day. The downside of delaying, possibly a week or more, shielding from a storm. For Richard and cameraman Diego Sosa, the decision was straightforward. Push on and avoid the risk of further delays. If we'd have missed that window, I think we'd have seriously jeopardised the challenge. Aconcagua means the sentinel of stone, nearly 7,000 metres high, 22,840 feet above sea level. On clear days, the summit ascent offers views of the Pacific Ocean, nearly 100 miles away. But in 55 kilometre winds and sub-zero temperatures, the views were the least of their worries. A German climber, a few days earlier, had slipped off the gully leading to the summit ridge and fell to his death. During the last 80 years, 126 people have died trying to reach the summit. The effects of high altitude, the main cause of death. The last 500 metres to the summit was an almost vertical scramble across rocks, with Richard and Diego breaking away from the group to make sure that they got there before the weather closed in. We're at just under 7,000 metres, the summit of Aconcagua, the highest mountain outside of the Himalayas. And people talk of it as an untechnical mountain, but oh my god, the altitude and the long days, that's brutal. We've been climbing for just under 12 hours. In six minutes' time, it'll be 12 hours of climbing. And we've got about five to seven hours descent. But what an awesome feeling. What a privilege. And the third third leg of my challenge down. How cool is that that all the team have joined up? A successful summit and Richard's priority, as always, a phone call home to mum and dad. Hey, ma'am, can you hear me? It's Richard. This is, officially, this is, I think, our highest phone call. Uh, I'm on the summit of Aconcagua. 36 days after standing on the South Pole, Richard had now achieved his third target and was now back on schedule to break the record. The South American leg safely accomplished, and on to the African continent's highest mountain, Kilimanjaro, and a trek with friends. 
to get to Killy was a milestone in the challenge for me personally and if the conditions were good and if I stayed healthy it could be an opportunity for me to recharge mentally and physically. I'd been quite isolated until that point. You know, it, it, it was fantastic to be with a group of people actually for the first time. This would be a relatively gentle leg for Richard and he'd be climbing with friends and supporters. Every day when you set off and you hit bad patches, I think you kind of think, why did I ever meet Richard Parks? You know, because if it hadn't been for him, I wouldn't be here today. Um, but at the end of the day, when you get to your camp and you look back at what you've achieved, it is absolutely amazing. It's a mountain sometimes derided for the number of tourists and celebrities who've scaled its slopes, but nonetheless a serious mountain at nearly 5,900 metres. Disrespecting the altitude has often had fatal consequences. An average of 10 people die on Killy each year. 15,000 people attempt to climb annually. 40% of them, around 6,000, actually reach the highest point. It's uh, five to three now. And uh, we haven't got long before we set off. We set off at midnight uh, for an estimated 18-hour uh, day, which, which actually, you know, Kilimanjaro being the the least technical and possibly on paper the the easiest of the seven summits. Actually, that's that's probably the longest summit day. It's even longer than an Everest summit day. So it's going to be a challenging day tomorrow, but I know it's going to be really rewarding when. Uh, and we all stand on the summit together. Twenty seventh, February, two thousand and eleven and the challenge more or less on track. But moving on to Asia and the technically tough Karstens Pyramid was already in Richard's thoughts. A series of flights to Indonesia and on to the island of West Papua and the mountain of Karstens, situated in the middle of dense tropical jungle. Karstens first conquered in 1962 only a few hundred people have ever climbed to the summit. Its inaccessibility, the jungle, and political instability in the region being the biggest hurdles to prospective climbers. It's so remote and so few people get the opportunity to climb it. And although we did it the harder way, I believe it was a pure experience. And I, I'm actually really grateful that, that we did trek in because you know, I got a better appreciation of, uh, of the continent, of the people, of the environment, and, you know, and an experience which at the time was, the time was really grim and really uncomfortable, but, you know, in hindsight, it was just an amazing experience. From the town of Ilago, it would take six or seven days trekking to reach base camp. There isn't an easy way to get to Karstens. Eight, nine or ten hour days with temperatures rising from 20 degrees at half past seven in the morning. Humidity at 90 percent. And of course, the rain. This is brutal, and it's only day one. No one footstep is the same as the last. And a lot of places is shin deep mud, it's just, it's just a real grind. Ah, 
what an awesome feeling huh? to finally get above, above the jungle. The long, hot and comfortable days and nights under the jungle canopy were now over. A chance to set up camp, but there were more hardships to come. The porters were finding the expedition hard work. Twice they refused to go any further until pay rises were agreed with a Papuan leader. One porter turned back suffering from malaria. After another pretty intense negotiation with the Papuan porters this morning, we're back on the trail and we're going to be arriving in a base camp tonight, which I've got to say I'm pretty excited about. It's been uh, five days trekking through the jungle and uh, the swamps of the Alpine region and now to be actually in or amongst the mountains is a pretty awesome feeling actually and uh, certainly the light at the end of the tunnel. After a week of arduous trekking, they were close to 14,800 feet and Richard still hadn't caught a glimpse of Carstens. That's, uh, that's our team mascot there. Our dog's been following us since, uh, since Ilago. It's pretty amazing, actually. We're at uh, just under 4,500 metres and uh, this is the last day until we get to base camp. We're about an hour away from base camp now and it's gone pretty quickly today. It's just nice to, uh, you know, to get the mind occupied as opposed to just a long trudge in. That's my first sight of Castens Pyramid. You can see it there just behind this ridge line and uh, disappearing into the clouds. Despite having the lowest summit altitude of the seven peaks, it's the most technically demanding. All of Richard's mountaineering skills would be called upon, and one chasm with a 300-foot drop was almost catastrophic for one of the group. When we got there, there was a fixed, uh, a fixed steel cable going across, and there was maybe uh, three or four safety lines. You have no idea who's fixed them, when they fixed them. Just, just, just pulling across. Just, yeah. Rest, 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 Bruno. Bruno. Just hang for a while. Uh, uh, there you go. Uh, Watch your hands. Uh, Watch your hands. Uh, Almost there. Two meters. Uh, Two meters. I clipped into all four of the safety lines, so you'd be, you'd be bloody unlucky if all four went. It's certainly, you know, not for the faint-hearted. The final route to the summit is virtually vertical, along precipices with sheer drops and jagged corners over the north face. The summit ridge was, was fantastic, but uh, there were pretty severe drops either side. I mean, it was a pretty sharp summit ridge. away from the summit Carsten's pyramid. Leg number five. I guess the halfway mark for me. Oh, it's been a tough day today. On 16th March, Richard successfully summited Carsten's pyramid. The most elusive and mysterious leg of the challenge had been completed. We'd really worked for it, you know, I felt like I'd earned it. There was a lot that could have gone potentially wrong. I'd heard stories of, you know, political instability between the tribes, believe it or not, people getting kidnapped out there, uh, the weather, there's all kinds of things that 
potentially or logistically could have gone wrong with that. So it, it was more relief than anything. He returned to the UK for some rest and intensive medical treatment before setting off again. The North Pole and Everest would be the next challenges ahead of Richard, and he'd be accompanied on both legs by Olympic gold medalist Steve Williams. On March 30th, they travelled to Norway, where they faced delays, as an ice runway was being built for their flight to the Arctic. It wasn't until April the 6th that they could take off on the first passenger flight of the year to land on the Arctic ice. After four days of delay, we've uh, finally got the green light to go. And uh, shit, uh, <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty nervous. We've uh, we finally got the green light to go then. Well, fingers crossed. Can't <laughs> take it off yet. <laughs> The party of explorers, scientists and adventurers were then flown by helicopter to the 89th degree, where the difficult and dangerous hike to the pole would really begin. Was, was brutally cold and you know mentally you just you just had to be absolutely on it every second of every day everything you did had a consequence well we're on our own now for the next five days they'd ski across the lethal icy wastelands pulling their sleds known as polks with all their kit and supplies to cross the 111 kilometers, they'd average around 20 kilometers a day at temperatures of minus 40. And that would get them to the pole, hopefully, on April 11th, but well behind schedule for Everest. The team had to be constantly wary of the surface below them. There were a number of narrow escapes the icy waters on this occasion lapped around their feet and they quickly tried to move to firmer ground. A serious crack can appear at any time and slipping into the icy Arctic is a real danger. The exact position of the geographic North Pole is marked by a Russian flag on the seabed under the polar ice cap. The ice on the surface moves, and so finding the exact spot is a challenge in itself. They had to use GPS technology, a global navigation satellite system, to track their whereabouts and the elusive North Pole marker. We were making these sort of drastic directional changes, because um, if you can imagine that the geographic North Pole is a stationary position at the bottom of the sea, and we're on uh, a floating uh, lead of ice, which obviously is moving above it. And we ended up almost chasing it. Now, Steve and myself have stood on the geographical North Pole. What an amazing feeling. This, uh, this truly is, you know, a beautiful and hostile environment at the top of the world. That was a particularly dangerous leg and certainly one that I was really happy to get, you know, to get, to get over successfully. There's our taxi home, Steve. There's our taxi home. From the North Pole to London, and within six days, they were already flying from Kathmandu to the frighteningly tiny runway of Lukla in Nepal. The landing strip is short and sloping, 
and is commonly known as the most extreme airport in the world. The flight from Kathmandu into Lucknow was just before uh, just before we took off. I heard that it was it was uh, rated as one of the most dangerous flights in the world or something like that. Probably a good thing I learned about that last minute. The delays in getting to the pole now meant that they'd lost precious acclimatization time on Everest. And some doubts were creeping in. I've been rock solid confident that I'll be nothing but successful from, from the challenge's conception. However, yesterday, there was an element of doubt in my mind, um, and that, that really rocked me. It really played in my mind last night. They met up with all kinds of people who had their own special reasons for attempting Everest. An 82-year-old man wanted to be the oldest person ever to summit. Tragically, he died en route. There have been fatalities on other mountains while I've been on there, on this challenge, and you hear them, but you just disassociate with them, you know, you don't, obviously you don't know them, you've not met them. This was a little bit different though, because um, we'd met this Nepalese guy on the trek in, and I just had so much admiration for him, you know, that obviously trying to be the oldest man to summit Everest is uh, it's pretty phenomenal. When I heard that sadly he had passed away, it was the first time that I'd actually had a connection and it, it, it was it was sad if I'm being honest and it and it, and it um, you know certainly uh, certainly rocked me for uh, for a day or two. The original plan was that Richard and Steve would join up with a full climbing expedition organized by the logistics team of the challenge. But this group had already had three weeks of acclimatization on Everest. The delays on the North Pole now meant that climbing with this group was impractical and dangerous. Along with their expedition leader, David Hamilton, they would need to devise a different and risky summit strategy. How it's... Yeah, we sat down with, uh, with David Hamilton, who was the expedition leader. The challenges that we had was that we were almost four weeks behind every other team there, and we really didn't have that much time. What's the last date we should aim for? And I think it's probably the 26th. Yeah, there's no fallback plan, is there? If the weather doesn't play along, yeah. you don't have a second chance. Conditions on Everest dictate that climbing can only occur at a certain time of the year. Within that season, weather conditions are key to a successful summit. These are the weather windows that climbers hope will come their way. The important thing is we do not push them too yeah, fast. Of if they get any altitude sickness, that will delay them by possibly five, yeah. six, seven days yeah. to yeah. recover, yeah. and that yeah. cause a problem. Yeah. And then so they could lose it. So. Yeah. We need yeah. to be quite conservative and just make sure that the first time they're in camp one, they can sleep comfortably. The first time they're in camp two, they can sleep comfortably. And then once we've solved that, the fact that they're strong people, I think they will make yeah. a good chance for a summit. It took them 12 days to get to base camp, and as they took part in the puja, a religious ceremony to bless their trip, the main group were leaving for the higher camps. It would be another three weeks before Richard could make a push for the summit. Patience and a measured build-up might lead them to success. Yeah, I guess I could say that I'm nervous on many levels about the climb ahead. Quite simply, I haven't got that luxury. Um, any weakness or doubt that I've got in myself or the strategy will be ripped open at altitude. You know, my psyche has to be rock solid and um, I just can't afford to let any doubt into my head at all, really. This is it, <laughs> two o'clock in the morning, May the 20th. God willing, sunrise in three days time, we'll be up at the top. Richard's strategy was not the traditional shuttle climbing, up to one camp and return to a lower camp to sleep and prepare the body for higher altitude.
To conserve energy, his push, although more risky, involved one long exposure to extreme altitude. This season had been particularly cold, with more cases than for many years of frostbite, snow blindness and retina freezing of the eyes. I knew physically it was going to be tough. I was, you know, I was prepared for that. But, um, you know, the constant self-doubt, the constant questioning was, it was really draining. I mean, every, every mental decision I made, every thought I had, every physical action I did, it was as if it was put under a microscope mentally. There were definite signs that the climbing season was rapidly coming to an end with Camp 2 starting to crumble, avalanches and rock slides on the increase. We're about three hours in to the climb up to Camp 2. The ice fall never really ceases to amaze me how much it changes from time to time. We're about 6,100 metres and the air's getting pretty thin now. There she is. This is probably the best view that we've had of Everest since I've been here. One slip crossing five ladder crevasses would be fatal. Progressing 1,000 metres at this stage through the Western Cum is a painstaking process. <coughs> then comes the most impressive wall of Everest, the Lhotse face. They passed the body of a Japanese climber here, who died a few days earlier. Supplementary oxygen now plays a vital part in aiding breathing, but as they moved from Camp 3 to Camp 4, Steve climbed again without an oxygen mask. It's a risk that I wouldn't have taken personally, because the summit was my target, but, you know, how... If you don't believe in your own ability, if you don't believe in yourself, well then, you know, what Steve even, you know, what were any of us doing on the mountain anyway? So I, I completely get, you know, it, you know, why he did it and why he had the confidence to do it. The death zone above 7,900 metres, 26,000 feet, is the point at which there isn't enough oxygen in the air to sustain human life, although a handful of individuals have succeeded. We're here in Camp 4, just under 8,000 metres. Really grateful to get to the tent and out the wind. The tent was just rattling and shaking, and it was it was just it, it was just wild. It was it was like something from another planet, I guess. The closest maybe I'll get. Obviously, at that altitude, we're we're on oxygen or supplementary oxygen, so you can't even really breathe for that long up there. I knew that we weren't going to summit that night and I just, I had, I just couldn't imagine the winds dropping. Right now we should be on the summit or at least approaching the summit. But last night we had to board our summit attempt due to really high winds. This means we've got an extra 24 hours up here in the death zone, it's just under 8,000 metres. And we're going to aim to attempt again tonight. I had a weird one last night. So I was just lying on the floor and I was shaking so much, I was so cold. This floor, we've got that much foam mat. And underneath that is just very cold ice and rock. And my legs and arms are just shaking uncontrollably. We've just got to keep our nerve. 
got to stay strong, stay focused, and just wait. I think she'll give us our chance. I really do. May 24th, and the prediction for low winds meant that a summit attempt was possible. But this would be their final opportunity. It was literally now or never. That was the first time I actually thought to myself, we're gonna have to do this, you know, we, we, it's now, like this is it. The wait was agonizingly long for the whole team. The family and friends back in Newport, powerless to help. As they left Camp 4 at nine o'clock at night, given the right conditions, they could summit in about nine hours. Steve slowly slipped behind Richard as they neared the summit ridge. Richard's mask froze and stopped supplying him with oxygen. The incredible Sherpa Mingma on his 17th ascent gave him his mask and Richard continued. One slip, one wrong step, there'd be no recovery. Tears of joy, not only at the top of Everest, but also back in Newport as Richard phoned home. Hi, Rich. Hi, Rich. How are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. Very proud. Exhausted, I felt, and very tired. I'm going to bloody bed now. Yeah. I want to say a big thank you to everyone for your back help. This made it possible for me. Steve Williams also summited, but as they descended to base camp, it was obvious that the mountain had left her mark. It's been a tough two and a half days, just being to see the medical centre here. What I thought was the bruise on my toenail is actually frostbite in my right big toe. To go from the elation of standing on, you know, the summit of Everest two days ago, two and a half days ago, to now being told that, you know, it's 50-50 that I'm going to make it to Denali. And even worse than that, it's 50-50 whether I'm actually going to lose my toe or not. I just don't know. I just don't know what to say. An emergency helicopter flight, immediate treatment at Kathmandu Hospital, and a flight back to the UK as soon as possible. With time running out, Denali would now become increasingly hard to surmount. With a frostbitten foot, would he even be allowed to attempt the summit? Once back in the UK, he sought an immediate consultation with an expert in frostbitten limbs. You can see the line here, and it's beginning already to, to separate. Mm. Um, you've got reasonably deep frostbite at the tip here. If that gets infected, well, it could lead to septicemia. That could actually, if you couldn't be evacuated quickly, which on a prolonged storm on Denali is perfectly mm. feasible, or high up on Denali, you may be looking at septicemia and uh, and death. Bottom line is, if it was me, 
I wouldn't go. Some were saying that it might heal in three weeks. Others were saying that it would take three months. Um, the general prognosis was pretty poor and the risks highlighted to me associated with continuing were, were scary and um, really difficult to get my head around. Uh, I joked in the past, you know, that if it, if it came to it, you know, I'd battle on and, and you know, I'd sacrifice a, a digit you know, for the success of the challenge. However, the reality of that was very different. Richard, though, wanted more opinions and more advice to be in the best possible position to make a decision. The Sheffield-based logistics team were just as keen to continue with the project, but their primary concern also was with Richard's health and safety. Going to Denali, there's always a risk of frostbite, risk of being stormbound in a tent, uh, acclimatisation issues, and we're going in there already impeded by frostbite. A lot to think about there is. and a lot, a lot to manage in terms of yeah. how, making sure that toe yeah. absolutely doesn't freeze again. On June 6th, Richard had been scheduled to leave for Denali, but his focus now was on receiving as much treatment as possible. That included a series of visits to the Multiple Sclerosis Therapy Centre in Swansea and sessions in the hyperbaric chamber that would improve the oxygen flow to his toe. Daily, I okay. Mean, I'm, I'm, it's really started to hurt now. Okay. That's that really good, isn't it? It is, isn't it? It's, you know, okay. it's nowhere near fully healed, but no. it's 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 of a point yes. now where I'm I'd be confident to climb on that. Keep it dry, warm, for as long as possible before you get going. And, yeah, uh, that should be fine. Now this is a big moment for me. It's been two weeks since, uh, not even that yet, just over two weeks since I've had a shoe on it. Very cool. We're back in the game, back in the game. The decision, and for anyone who even slightly doubted the resilience and determination of Richard, came as no surprise. I was getting pretty frustrated and restless and at some point, I'm not quite sure when, but at some point I literally just decided either do this or I don't and I just decided to do it. Um, but that decision wasn't easy to come to. The highest mountain on the North American continent lies 150 miles north of Anchorage in Alaska. Its more common name was Mount McKinley, but its local native name is Denali, meaning the Great One. A year earlier, Richard had climbed Denali as part of his preparation for the challenge. Even taking Everest into consideration, he always thought that this time around, Denali would be his most difficult hurdle. I always knew that I would be coming off Everest emotionally, physically, mentally empty or depleted. And Denali in its own right is a pretty tough proposition. Less than half the climbers who attempt the mountain actually summit. There are no Sherpas or porters on Denali. Climbers have to carry all their equipment. Richard and his climbing partner, Matt Parks, would each have 45 pound rucksacks on their backs and be pulling sleds with 100 pounds on board. The mountain is located between the Arctic and Aleutian weather systems, which means that some of the most ferocious weather conditions on the planet are created around the summit. One hundred mile an hour winds have scooped up climbers in the past and hurled them down the slopes. Would his frostbitten foot endure the bitter cold temperatures of minus 40? And there were added dangers now because of the time delays caused by Richard's injury. It's been pretty warm the last couple of days and the snow is really soft and wet, which um, 
which isn't good for traveling up the glacier and over crevasses. Obviously we want the snow to be as hard as possible to make uh, the snow bridges and the crevasse crossings as uh, well as safe as possible. I'll be a lot happier when we get today over with, if I'm being honest. Uh, you know, everyone that everyone we've spoken to is just not really saying anything positive about getting through the, the lower part of the glacier and through the crevasses. Richard and Matt were alone, travelling a well-trodden route between base camp and the next camp at 7,500 feet, an area ridden with dangers, deep crevasses crisscrossing the zone. But this late in the season, they're often covered by soft snow. Day one, and only two hours out from base camp. Fuck. That was so lucky. I've just dropped through a crevasse and a big one. Oh God, that was so scary. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I've fallen about six, seven meters and I've landed on a ledge. My polk is behind me, further down as you can see. And Matt's above the ground. I imagine now he's putting her anchor in and starting a crevasse rescue pulley system. Oh my God. For me, one of the oh scariest God. moments of my life was as I looked left, um, the crevasse must have opened up and as I looked left, I just looked into a black abyss and blackness like I've never seen it before. And I mean, I can still see it now. It still sort of uh, haunts me now. And, I, and not, I was in a smaller chamber of the crevasse and, and the blackness that I'm talking about was a, a larger chamber of the same crevasse, which was probably the size of a cinema. And it absolutely scared the living daylights out of me. Um, and for the next hour and a half that I was in the crevasse, I simply didn't look left. Another team behind us have joined Matt and helping Matt. Rescue me. Um, we've been here about 40 minutes now. And, oh and wet and cold, starting to shiver, and luckily enough, I've got my mitts to hand and keep my toes moving. You know, this is uh, this is frostbite territory again. Shit. Hey, is this pretty much? Am I under air now? No, that's solid where your shovel is there. So this is solid here? Yeah, that's all ice there. Uh, this is air? Yeah. Oh, I'm really cold now. I'm absolutely soaking wet. Uh, I can't move because my sled, which is about 100 pounds, I have no idea what that is in kilos, is pulling me down. So you can see it's pulling me backwards and I can't stand up and I'm sort of jammed on on the ice. I thought obviously now I'm just constantly trying to move my fingers, toes, trying to move as much as I can to keep the blood circulation going in them because the last thing I want is to well, get further damage, but also get pulled off the mountain now on the first day. I was pulled out and the, the honest truth is, is if it wasn't for, well, the reality was that as a pair, if it wasn't for that other team uh, that came up behind us, I'm confident that between Matt and myself, we would, I would have got out of the crevasse, but at what expense? Um, whether it would have taken longer or whether I'd had to ditch my gear, um, it probably would have meant the end of the challenge. Hi Matt, uh, I'm okay down here. Um, pretty wet and starting to get cold, but nothing too serious. 
Thanks, mate. I really appreciate this. I missed that, but I'm pretty sure it was Saki, so I'm probably better off not hearing it. Another huge test of his resolve, and an incident that could so easily have ended in tragedy. The experience of Matt Parks, allied with the luck of another team passing by, allowed the rescue to happen. The brave decision then was to trek on for another six hours before getting to camp. I think it's testament really to us as a team and to our mental state that we quickly decided that we were going to push on. And if anything, that was the worst part of that day, that those six hours were the longest six hours of my life. It's reliving that fall, sort of every step. There were, of course, many more crevasses to cross. That's scary big, that is. Don't go following this one, Parksy. The infamous toe was obviously painful and was causing concern. I don't know what to do, what do I do? Just leave it on. Unless it's fallen off, hasn't it, to so take it off. I think. Should I cut it off? I don't know. Maybe you should just leave it on until it actually just fall, falls off, if it's, like, going to protect it. Yeah. Man, that is disgusting. Thanks, mate. The forecast now, though, was for severe snowstorms. Both he and Matt needed to build snow walls and bed down for a few days until conditions improved. After four pretty good days uh, and arriving at Camp 14 yesterday in uh, pretty perfect conditions, I woke up this morning to uh, a raging snowstorm. Anyway, it looks like we're Gonna have to sit this one out for three to five days minimum. Typical. I mean, this is, you know, what Denali's famous for. Not the best site to wake up to in the morning. When the storm subsided, they made progress towards the 17,000-foot camp, the springboard to the summit. But they'd already encountered returning teams who had been battered by the weather higher up and been forced to turn back. The conditions meant that nobody had summited for two or three days. In fact, the last person to leave high camp was still missing. There was a rescue helicopter circling above us, looking for the climber that hadn't come back two days prior. We later found out that they found his body. He'd fallen off the summit ridge. So it, it was just a really tough day, mentally and physically. The totally inexperienced mountaineer of two years ago was now leading the way on one of the world's most formidable slopes. We're probably about half hour to an hour away from the summit, but as shattered as I am, and as brutal as today has been, it, I go through every second again for these views. They're just absolutely phenomenal. On June 30th, after a 10 and a half hour summit climb, Richard Parks, along with climbing companion Matt Parks, stood on the highest point of the North American continent. There she is. Good work, mate. Adventure getting you. I'm so grateful to you, Parks. 
Okay, nice. Thank you. Oh, wow. Eight legs successfully completed. One more to go. It was really tough, but a really special and rewarding experience, especially after the three, three to four weeks before that. The uncertainty with the toe, the crevasse fall, it was probably the highlight of the challenge for me and certainly a, a summit that was, that was really special. A stop off in London, a change of kit, and on the 8th of July, he was on his way to Russia and the unnerving experience of entering kabardino balkaria in the Northern Caucasus. The area is located close to Georgia and North Ossetia, a troubled and insecure region. The deaths of three people in February on the southern slopes led to an international restriction on travel, and Foreign Office warnings advised travellers to avoid the area completely. Dark bearded foreigners are stereotypically looked upon with suspicion. Quite quickly I realised that as foreigners we stood out like a sore thumb. I did everything I could to be as inconspicuous as, as I could be. The arrangements for this leg were obviously very different to any of the others. Richard and Matt were whisked away by Sergei and Max their Russian liaison team. Passing armed guards at Russian checkpoints and negotiating a way through to the mountain was one of Sergei's major contributions. We had to pass a checkpoint or two, which we bypassed safely. However, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to experience having an AK-47 pointed at me again. Once at base camp, the trek up the mountain got underway immediately. Get in and get out as quickly as possible without drawing any attention was the strategy. From base camp, which is at 2,300 meters, twice the height of Snowdonia, the first part of the climb took them through gently rolling green hills. The barren and rocky terrain of the next section reflected the bleakness that altitude can create. High camp is 1,500 metres above base camp and is a hard day's trek. As they reached the snow line, the final climb would happen the following day. I'm feeling pretty excited that this is going to be the last summit day for a while. You look like you can hardly contain yourself. I know, I, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just about ready to pop. <laughs> last one, want to go. Leaving at three in the morning, they would be aiming to summit after about nine hours climbing. The conditions were perfect, and sunrise over the Caucasus Mountains was spectacular. We were blessed this morning with just an amazing sunrise. And just these, uh, these magnificent rays coming out from behind the clouds, it was pretty spectacular. What an amazing way, I guess, to finish the challenge. Having set off from the South Pole on January the 1st, 2011, he was about to successfully complete his amazing 737 challenge in six months and 12 days. Just before midday Russian time, 9 o'clock UK time, on July the 12th, 
2011, Richard Parks summited Mount Elbrus, the highest mountain in Europe. See, no tears. None of that. Go on, just one first part. Uh, no tears. <laughs> oh. I was very much in the moment and it was a fantastic feeling summiting Albrecht, but it didn't really sink in until I got back to high camp that I'd finished this and that that the challenge had that we'd done it. The descent to high camp and then down to base camp was obviously an anticlimax. The enormity of what he'd achieved would not really sink in for a long, long time. And on the plus side, his toe had withstood the final trek. The sooner I can get in flip-flops for like two months, the better, really. How do you celebrate a world's first on the side of a Russian mountain? They did their best. <laughs> he finally arrived back in the UK to a personal, intimate welcome from mum and dad and a much relieved Simon Lowe, the logistics organiser. The plan, after all, had worked. He's not going to get away that easy. Well done, congratulations. Wales and the UK had a new world record holder, and he'd returned to the quayside in Cardiff, where it all began seven months earlier. Thanks for coming down. Have you missed any school today? No. no. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. I feel incredibly proud of, of what I've achieved. I think the reception at the Senedd coming back into Cardiff probably was the first time that I realised quite the significance of what I, what, what we've achieved. It's overwhelming and pretty amazing, but I can't quite get that into my head yet. Um, I don't feel any different, why, why should I? I still haven't even processed the last six months for myself. Um, I guess that'll take time. This is the man who stood on the South Pole, scaled the highest mountain on Antarctica, reached the peak of the Andes, and trekked to the roof of Africa. He endured the jungles of Papua and climbed Karsten's Pyramid in Australasia. He withstood the ice flows of the Arctic and stood on the geographical North Pole. The mighty Everest tested him to the limit, but he got there. Not even the deadly crevasses of Denali could prevent him from standing on the highest peak of North America. And when he looked over Russia from the top of Elbrus, he'd done it. The seven summits and the three poles within seven months. Richard Parks had conquered the world. <laughs>